Okay, so first, uh, the first of many typos. Uh, before, I think I put some minus sign here somewhere. That was wrong. There's only pluses. And just a reminder, these ends are things on a sphere, so they square to one. Okay? Don't hesitate to call me out on any mistakes that I make, please. Uh, okay, so uh, we've been fairly analytic so far. Uh, now we're going to start getting into more of the, uh, the numerics uh, side of it. So uh, I told you that these methods for computing conformal blocks, they are not very efficient. So there are two methods that we actually use in practice uh, for computing them. Um, so I'm going to tell you about one of them in some detail, uh, and then the other one very briefly, since it's, it's roughly equivalent. So I'm going to tell you about a method called the pull method. OK? So recall that so conformal blocks, they have a, an expansion that looks schematically like this. So there's delta, O1, Pn, delta P, Lp, then the conjugate state, uh, Kn, Ox, delta. Delta P, L, P, K, N, P, N, Delta P, L, P. Okay, so this is schematic, right? The more correct version is what I wrote for the conformal partial waves, okay? So, but there are N, P's, there are N, K's, and they are contracted via this inverse matrix, okay? This expression in D equals one is actually correct, written as is, right? In higher dimensions, well, this is a matrix with indices. Um, but okay, uh, again, in D equals one, this is, this is correct. So something to notice is that in the denominator, we have the norms of the descendants, okay? And so if you think of the conformal block as a, fun as a function of uh, the conformal dimension and the spin, then you can imagine that if you play around with those parameters, you might reach points where this norm is zero. Okay? This would mean that this descendant becomes a null state. Okay? And in fact, so something that you can show is that if a certain descendant is a null state, then all its descendants are also null, uh, and they form a separate rep representation of the conformal group. So let's see how this works. Uh, suppose that uh, you have some state, chi, and chi is, has zero norm. This is zero, right? But what's this? This is the same as um, uh, chi uh, kn. Uh, chi. Uh, so it's telling you that the action of k on, on this state, um, k has to kill this state, right? It's the only possibility. What did you mean delta p on the, on the state on the right side? Sorry? Here? here? Yes, oh, of course, of course, yes. So the only possibility is that k kills uh, uh, the state, okay? But if k kills the state, then this is actually a primary, okay? So uh, when the descendant becomes null, it becomes a primary at the same time. It's a primary and a descendant, and that's why its norm uh, is zero. And you can work it out that now if you act with more p's, when you compute the norm of those states, it's also going to be zero because in the end it's always proportional to the original norm of the primary. Okay? So such a state with all its descendants forms a separate representation of the conformal group. Um, 
Why is this important? Uh, it's important because it's telling you that as you dial delta p to the, to the, to the appropriate value, uh, where, the value where there's a pole, then you expect to look something like this. Okay. So delta k is the, it's the dimension of the state, which is null. Well, from this you can see. Well, suppose, for instance, that uh, that, uh, that there was uh, there was uh, uh, no when. Okay, you just dial delta to the, the appropriate value, some delta k, such that that state is going to be uh, null. If that state is null, then any descendant of it is also going to be null, right? So, p of delta k. So this also has to be 0, right? But then, you know, you can just read this like this. k acting on this state is 0. So this state is a primary. Orthogonal to the bra. Well, in a, in a sense, yes. It's the, it's the state at the same level. It's, a, it's the state at the same level as delta k. So. There's only one state there. You can think of it like this. It's a, it's a state that's orthogonal, but it, you can also just commute k past p and get 2 d, and then it's just going to be proportional to the original norm. So it's actually the same state. So. Again, you expect the block that as you dial delta p to one of these special values of delta k, where the primary becomes a null state, uh, then what can happen is that, so there will be a divergence because the norm is becoming 0. Then there's some, some residue. And the residue will involve a new conformal block, okay, corresponding to the exchange of all, all these states. So of course, the only possibility is that because of the Casimir equation, so this, since this has to kill by the Casimir equation, then the Casimir of this block has to be the same as the Casimir of this block. Okay? But it, they don't have to be the same. So for instance, in d equals 1, uh, then the only possibility uh, is that um, delta prime is equal to uh, 1 minus uh, delta p. So let me see, delta k, maybe I should write this as, yeah, delta k prime is 1 minus delta k. You can check that the Casimir corresponding to this value and this value are the same. Okay, so the block that you get here will be this one. Okay. So this is a general idea. If you have a, a general conformal block, then as you, as you move around in delta, you may, you may hit poles. And the residue of that pole is a new conformal block. Okay? And that block will also be some sum of poles with residue. So you see that you can iterate this. Okay? So for instance, let's consider d equals 1. In d equals 1, the, the, the norm of the descendant of level n uh, so maybe I should put a p here. We've already showed that it's 2 delta n, n factorial, right? I computed this before. And this is equal 0 if delta is equal to minus n over 2 for any integer n. Okay. So there are zeros at these points. So the conformal block could have poles at any of, of these values. So however, you can check that for uh, when delta is equal to minus m, so an integer, not a half, uh, a negative integer, not a negative half integer, uh, 
then the residue of these poles is actually zero. Okay, so you could just do the computation or you could look at, you know, I gave you the formula for the block as these matrix elements, right? So you can just check that these matrix elements, when delta is equal to that value, they become zero and they cancel the, uh, the pole. Okay, so the, actually there isn't a pole there. Uh, so actually at, what happens in that case is that the, the conformal block truncates, the sum defining the conformal block truncates to a finite uh, sum and you get G minus M of X is two M factorial. This is the Legendre polynomial of level M. So instead of some nasty hypergeometric uh, function, it just becomes a Legendre polynomial up to some coefficient. Okay. However, for negative half integer, so one half minus n, then there is a genuine pole, okay? And so we expect, again, at this point, that the residue of this pole is proportional to a conformal block with the same Casimir. And so the only possibility is that the residue will go like g of one half plus n, right? So this is a block whose conformal dimension has the, is the same, corresponds to the same Casimir as this one. So I just did one minus this. Okay, as I explained. Uh, now, the residue at the pole, what is it? If you go back to that sum and the, the, the definition in terms of the hypergeometric, then you can see that the, the only term that contributes the residue at delta equals a half minus n is the term delta 2n, delta 2n divided by 2 delta to the 2n to n uh, factorial x to the delta plus 2n, right? So the block was an infinite sum, right, over many integers. And this particular term in the, t in the sum, where x appears to the power delta plus 2n, contributes uh, to this residue, OK? There's a pole there. And the residue can just work it out. It's uh, whatever minus pi 2 to the minus 4n, n factorial, gamma 1 half minus n uh, squared, gamma n, x to the n plus a half. Right, I think that's right. So, which is the same as, which by definition is our at residue n times x to the n plus half. OK? So this is the first term that contributes uh, a residue to that pole. OK? Then there are many others. But this is the first one. OK? Why is this important that it's the first one? Because we can read off the conformal dimension. So this is consistent with the fact that I told you that uh, the residue should, should be a block with dimension a half plus n. Right? Here it is. X, the first term in the definition of the conformal block is x to the delta, and delta is n plus a half. And so if you normalize the blocks like this plus corrections, then this has to be the residue, okay, in that definition. So what you expect then is that g delta of x can be written, so naively, you expect that this is some contribution at infinity, plus uh, sum n delta plus n minus a half g a half plus n. Okay? So you expect something like this to be true, right? So the, the block is a sum over all its poles. So as a, as a, as a function of delta, this is how we're thinking. So you think that it's, it's just a meromorphic function of delta, then it's just the sum over the poles with the residues, right? Plus the contribution at infinity, right? Any meromorphic function can be written in this way. We figured out what the residues, they are given by this expression and that block, so. This is not quite true because as it turns out, when you compute this, this, uh, this expression, uh, it turns out that g of infinity, yeah takes the following form, 
grow. Okay. And uh, so this is not analytic at infinity, for instance, right? Um, so this is actually not quite correct. But if you define a function h delta of x, which is 4 rho to the minus delta times g delta of x, so you, you subtract off this, this behavior, then this is a meromorphic function in delta. And the expressions replacing everything, the g, the g by h, is correct. Okay? So when you work out what this implies for g, it turns out that the correct version of this is that uh, so g delta of x is g infinity of x plus 4 rho delta and then sum n equals 1 plus infinity 4 rho n minus a half delta plus n minus a half r n g n plus a half. Okay? So there's this slight modification. Notice that at the pole, it still works out. It gives the same residue that we worked out before because this delta is going, so this, this is becomes zero, so this cancels with this. Okay? So this is the correct expression. Um, Yes. So instead of, instead of working instead of working with G, work with H. Okay, so the function you wrote on the right that would be H. No. So I wrote tentatively I wrote this. Mm -hmm. This is wrong because the at the behavior at infinity it has it's non analytic. So you instead you write this but for this function. So it's, it becomes almost exactly the same. So you need to subtract by these uh, four rows. Okay? You write that out. That's correct. And then you just multiply everything back by four rows to the delta. So this is why this is multiplying here outside. Okay? Is, that, is that clear? So. You can turn this into a recursion relation that you can use on the computer. I've given you g of infinity. It's an explicitly known function. Okay? If you want to compute at any delta, then you can do the following. You can define g delta k is g infinity plus 4 rho delta sum times g 1 half plus n k minus 1. And you say that g delta 0 of x is g infinity of x. So here we're going to put some cutoff. OK? So you define the kth term in the recursion in this way. So it only depends on the k minus 1 uh, uh, expressions for the blocks. And you start the, recur the recursion by saying that to leading appro approximation, the block is just this infinity contribution. Okay? You start off th with this, and then on the next round, you're going to get that plus these blocks approximated by this. And then you do it again, so now it's going to be more complicated. And so you can do it as many times as you want. In practice, you don't need to do many. Okay, like a handful will do. And I also put a cutoff here, because we cannot use infinite terms in the recursion relation. And you can play with this. But also you don't need, again, it depends at which point you're evaluating the recursion. But you can see that each term in this sum is suppressed by this power 4 rho to the n. And just to give you an idea, for, for x equals a half, which is, as you see, it's a, it's a point which we typically use in doing the, the numerical bootstrap. 
We are interested in evaluating blocks and their derivatives at x equals a half. At this point, rho is 0 0.17, OK, which is quite small. So this sum actually converges very fast, OK? So needless to say, here I gave you a, a recursion relation for the value of the block at a point. But from this, you can get the derivatives, either by direct computation of the function, differentiating the function, or more efficiently, just define a recursion relation for the derivative. Almost nothing changes, right? You can just work it out. Uh, and so I think this is one of the most used methods for computing the, the blocks numerically. So here, I wrote you how you to do it in d equals 1. So you can just try it by yourself. If you want to do it in uh, higher dimensions, the logic is exactly the same. What's going to change? What's going to change is the possible poles. OK, so you need a list where can poles appear, for which deltas, for which spins. You need, you need a list of the residues. What are the residues that appear? And then you do exactly the same. You just put this on the computer, and you can compute it uh, iteratively. Uh, and so uh, I think in generic dimension d, well, I found one reference that gives you the residues in poles, but I think maybe there's even people in this audience which can give you perhaps uh, another one. But certainly in this paper, uh, 1702.03. 938. This, this paper, this is a 9. A very poor, sickly 9. Um, in this paper, there should be a full list for any D. Uh, let me see if I have the original reference. The original paper that did this did it in D equals 3, so they, it, they gave you only the list for D equals 3. Um, anyway, this is one reference where you can find this list of poles. Uh, and, and residues. Yes? Where is the mileage coming from? Is it that uh, this particular g half plus m large is really easy or something? Because it seems like you're writing g of delta in terms of a sum of a bunch of. No, no, but these guys. No, but look at the recursion relation. At the end, the only thing that you need to know is this one. That's true. But so I, I had an original function which you wrote as a hypergeometric. Yes. Yeah, in that case, why do this, right? Yeah, Is that the question? That's what I mean, yeah. Well, in d equals 1, you don't. But in higher d, like in d equals 3, there is no closed form expression for the blocks. So in even d, it's some products of hypergeometrics. But even then, computing the derivatives of that yeah, so that's what I mean. numerically is hard. The derivatives of these ones are easier? Yeah, you can just write down a recursion relation for the derivative, right? It's the same thing. You just put some d's here. And you get some extra factors, but the same thing will work for the derivatives, right? So you just use this recursion relation for everything, for evaluating it at any point that you want, the derivatives at that point. And this converges very fast. You put it on the computer, it gets the value quite fast. So if you don't have expressions for the blocks, um, in fact, what's usually used in the numerics is that uh, you derive this representation, okay, such that the blocks are correct to, you know, something like 50 digits or something. And this is, does not take a lot of time, usually. And notice that at the same time, this is going to give you the, the pole as some rational function, uh, the pole, sorry, the block as a rational function in delta. So this is extremely useful. It means that if you need to change the value of delta, once you've computed this representation, this rational function, you compute it once and for all, and then you can evaluate any block that you want at that, at that point or its derivatives just by changing this value, OK? So you compute these rational representations once, you store them on the computer, and then you just evaluate them whenever you need them. That's the logic, OK? Um, so uh, again, so this is one way. Let me just comment on a different way, which you can get the same thing. I mean, so I, I'm going to be quick. Um, these, these two methods, they appeared roughly at the same time. So the other method is the Casimir method. So I think Chris told you that, so the blocks satisfy this differential equation. 
right? But there's another differential equation that is satisfied by considering the quadratic, the quartic Casimir of the conformal group. There are two independent Casimirs in general. There's a quadratic one and there's a quartic one. So accordingly, there's going to be some fourth order differential operator with some eigenvalue. Okay, C4. And you know, so these expressions. So if you want to see this, let me just give you the reference. Uh, 1305.1321. Okay. You can read about this in more detail. Uh, but so there are two steps. So first, you combine L4 and L2 to get some new operator. Uh, which gives you the conformal block on the diagonal. So recall that the, the, the blocks, they are functions of u and v, and you can trade u and v for z and z bar. Okay? So z equals z bar. This function is annihilated by some, some differential operator of, of fourth order. Okay? So this gives you the block on the diagonal. It's, you can get this by combining this with this. So that's step one. So now, since you have a differential equation for the block, you can turn this into a recursion relation for the coefficients in the expansion of the block, right? You can solve any differential equation iteratively in Taylor series. So this gives you a recursion relation. So now you have a recursion relation which gives you the block for at any point where z equals z bar, okay? And you can turn this recursion relation to essentially something that's like that. You get all the poles as well in this way. And then you can use, um, this Casimir to go away, uh, so use the fact, use this equation to get the block away from that line. Okay? So, for instance, usually what it's done is that you use this equation to compute the block very accurately at a point, or its derivatives at a point. Okay? Usually a half, z equals z bar equals a half. And then to compute derivatives which are transverse. Uh, to, to the z equals z bar line, you can show that this equation can be used to generate them also recursively. So if you know all the derivatives on this line, this equation tells you how to get derivatives along the, the transverse direction. Okay? So again, by combining these two, you can get some efficient numerical uh, way to, uh, to compute the blocks. And it's the, it's the same. At the end of the day, when you go through these recursion relations, what you do is that you compute them for any delta, and you end up with a rational function representation uh, for the blocks. So the, the net out, output is the same. Okay. And uh, numerical, in terms of numerical efficiency, I think these are roughly compatible, roughly the same, in my experience. So it's a bit of a matter of taste, or most likely you just get someone else's Mathematica notebook that's already written. So. You won't have to worry about this. But, um, uh, yes? What's the expression of gate with respect to x1, x4? What's the expression of what? How does this relate to this? Yeah. It's, you know, go look it up in the paper. It's some nasty thing, but you type it once into Mathematic and then you forget about it. But the logic is this combine this with this. Both these guys, they involve derivatives along the transverse direction, but you can combine them to cancel them and get an equation that only depends on this. Incidentally, this equation uh, in, in one dimension reduces to the equation that I showed you before for the block, for the d equals 1 block, as it, as it had to, right? There can be no other equation. In d equals 1, there's no transverse direction. There's only this one. Okay, so this is probably more than you ever wanted to know about conformal blocks. <laughs> It took some time to get to this uh, state of the art. Uh, but anyway, we've sorted the problem out once and for all. Um, but actually, there's still a bunch of open questions. So here I've been talking about conformal blocks for, <coughs> uh, for scalar correlation functions. But if you have operators with spin, for instance, then it's quite involved to get these rational uh, function representations for those blocks. And it has, it has not been fully worked out in all cases of interest. But anyway, for scalars, uh, I think we've understood things. And again, I've specialized things to the case where all the, the external operators have the same dimension. 
but it's, it's trivial to generalize this when they have different dimensions. Okay? You, might, you, you can need that if you're boot, bootstrapping correlators with operators, uh, uh, different operators in the correlation function. Okay, so questions about this? So I don't think I've asked for it, but you know, you should try it out just implementing that, this recursion relation in Mathematica and then compare with the exact result. And you can see how many terms you need to include. Does it converge fast or not? It's fun if you feel like that sort of thing. OK, so this has been quite technical, right? So let's get to the good stuff now. So let's analyze the crossing equation. So recall that the crossing equation was the sum of the OPE coefficient squared times this f functions, which depended on the external dimension in a simple way. Uh, and then this was equal to the contribution of the identity, we put it here. OK? And these are functions which now you know how to compute. I taught you how to compute them. So we want to extract information from, from this equation. Uh, and it turns out that to do this, we're going to have to do some, uh, some truncations. Because this equation contains a continuously infinite set of constraints, which is hard to work with. Uh, so it's useful to consider just a finite set of the constraints. We're not doing an approximation here. We're just considering a subset of the possible constraints. Okay? And eventually, we want to include more and more and more. So idea, you start with this f, which is a function of u and v. And we're going to turn this into a vector, namely some derivatives at a half, uh, sorry, a quarter, a quarter, d1, d3, OK? So I, I'm being schematic here in the derivatives. Uh, I also, I only put odd ones. Uh, the odd ones has to do with the fact that these functions, they are anti-symmetric when you swap z with 1 minus z and z bar with 1 minus z bar, or when you swap u and v. OK? So some derivatives are 0. This is what I, what I mean by this. Uh, but uh, OK, so you want to compute these, these f's and their derivatives Numerically, at this point, this point is the point z equals z bar equals a half uh, to some order, OK? Such that this vector is in Rn, OK? So this is just a vector of numbers. For each delta L and delta phi, delta L and delta phi, you have some vector. For any such choice now, you know how to compute it efficiently, OK? So I'm going to call this object uh, uh, v, v alpha, where alpha stands for the fact that there's delta, there's L. Anyway, it's just a label on this vector. But it's a vector in, R, in Rn. OK? And so our truncated crossing equation is now there's some sum over alpha. There's some coefficients a alpha, some vectors v alpha. Uh, and this is equal to some other vector, t, which I call the target, which is uh, v naught. OK, it's the identity. OK? So this sum is still a sum over anything, right? So we want to consider this crossing equation has to hold for any CFT. So we make no assumptions on what the quantum numbers that appear here can be. 
We don't say it's discrete. I mean, it's just anything. So this is the general form of the sum rule. And again, we've made no approximation here. We've done a truncation. We're only considering a subset of the constraints. But there's no, there's no mistake. This equation is still exactly true for any CFD. OK? Uh, notice also that I've, I've turned the lambda squares into this A. And it's very important that these coefficients are positive. Why are they positive? So this is important. They're positive because they're squares of some number. And this number has to be real. It has to be real because we're considering the four-point function of four real scalar operators. Okay? So if you look at the OP of those two operators with some other one, reality tells you that the three-point function has to be real. So the OP coefficient has to be real. It can be positive or negative, but it has to be real. And hence, its square is positive. In theories which are non-unitary, this does not have to be the case. Because implicit here is the fact that you normalize two-point functions operators such that they look like 1 divided by x squared or something. But if the norm is negative, if you choose to normalize this in this way, then the OP coefficients will pick up an i, okay, because of the square root of the minus 1. Okay? And so this would actually could be negative in non-unitary theories, okay, where the norm is negative. But for unitary theories, this is true. So this is very, very important. OK, so we want to extract information uh, from this equation. And so how people usually do it is that, well, we know that this equation has some solutions because CFTs exist. Right? So let's make assumptions on the quantum numbers that are allowed in this sum rule. OK? So for instance, one thing that you can do, which is, I think is the first thing that was done, is we can set a gap to the first non-trivial scalar operator appearing in the OP of phi with itself. So phi with itself is equal to the identity and then some operators alpha, right? Many of them. OK? So what we're going to say is that uh, at L equals 0, delta has to be larger than some gap. OK? So recall that so unitarity uh, implies the following, implies that for L equals 0, delta should, should be greater or equal than D minus 2, uh, or 0. So maybe I should max D minus 2 over 2, 0. And uh, for L greater than 0, delta must be greater or equal than L plus D minus 2. OK? So these are the constraints from unitarity of a CFT. Uh, so where does this come from? It comes from that computation of the norm that I showed you before, right? In one dimension, uh, you have to compute this norm K, KN, PN, right? And you get that Pockhammer symbol, 2 delta N, N factorial. You need to demand that this is positive, and in the equals 1, this tells you that delta has to be positive. So as long as the dimension of the primary is positive, then the norms of the descendants, they are all positive as well. So in higher dimensions, it's a bit more complicated because there's spin, but you can work out the same thing. So you consider descendants of some primary, you compute the norms of the descendants, and you get constraints. And the constraints are precisely those ones. OK? Again, it's unitarity gives you this. So what we're going to do is that for L equals 0, we'll, we're going to impo impose a stronger constraint, okay? set by some gap, which we vary. And you can 
put it up or down, but never below that. And for the other spins, 2, 4, etc., use the unitarity. So we allow anything consistent with unitarity. Okay? So notice, so it means that in this sum, it's still a continuous sum. Okay? There's an infinite set of spins and there's a continuous set of uh, conformal dimensions. Okay, so this is quite mild. And we want to see, is it, is it true that for any delta gap, that equation has solutions? Okay? So we start off with the gap at unitarity. There a solution has to exist because free theory exists. And now you crank it up, you crank it up, you crank it up. And the idea is that at some point, that equation will not have solutions. Okay? And as you add more and more constraints, as you add more and more components, then the maximum p value of the gap is going to go down, 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 until hopefully it stabilizes. Okay? So that's, does that make sense? So that's the hope. That's what we're going to try to do. We're going to set this gap and try to prove that that equation cannot have solutions. This would rule out any CFT satisfying these conditions. Okay? Uh, so questions? No? Yes. This is schematic, yes. So if, if you just evaluate f at this point, it's zero. So you need to take at least one derivative. But so the derivatives along the z equals z bar line, they have to be odd. But the derivatives along the z different from z bar, those can be anything that you want. So this is schematic, this is what I said. Just compute all the derivatives that you want. Some of them will be zero, so uh, that's, I mean, you don't need to include them. Okay? More questions? And yes? And this choice of derivatives, then it's not unique. We're just taking an equation. Yeah. What if we take values of the function at very different points? Around? Yes, well, look at the problem set. This is exactly what I'm going to ask you to do. But is it clear that, or is it experimentally known that this is the best one? Yes. Not proven, but just you try it, and this turns out to be the best choice. This is the first choice that was made, and it was the best. <laughs> so it's lucky, luck of the beginner. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing intrinsically profound about this, uh, this point, I think. It's a point that's symmetric uh, with respect to crossing. So crossing swaps v and u, and it, it maps z to 1 minus z, and z bar 1 minus z bar. So this is a, a, a point that doesn't care about direct channel or cross channel. This is why people chose it in the first place, but uh, there could be better choices. There could be better choices for these constraints. Just no. The one problem with using points is that which points do you pick? There are many possible choices. In fact, I think in the problem sets, uh, I, I don't say which choice, so it's up to you. I give you an idea so that you can get something, but uh, anyway, you're right. So this is arbitrary. You just want to select out a, a, a finite set of constraints out of this, and you, you should play with it and see what works best. But in the end, it's going to be this. <laughs> anyway, okay, so this seems hopeless still, right? So you have this continuously infinite sum. How are we ever going to learn something about this? So this is what people thought until 2008. Um, also, people had poor control of blocks, and maybe Mathematica was I mean, <laughs> it slowly improved <laughs> up to then. But I mean, most of what I'm writing, it, it was known for a long time. Huh? Now, the key idea is what I'm going to tell you. It's the idea of establishing bounds and why the bounds are posi possible. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't remember the reference of the paper, but it's a paper by Richkov, Vicky, uh, Hatadzi, and uh, Tony in 2008. Yeah, I should have it here. So it's the most important paper in this conference. Um, so why is a bound possible? Well, let me tell you why. So we have, we have a sum over vectors with some coefficients is equal to some other vector, OK? So let's take n equals 3, OK? Let's just consider three derivatives, OK? And focus on this side. What do you have here? There's a gazillion vectors. And you have to consider all, pos all possible linear combinations of those vectors, right? 
in, in general. So the A's are arbitrary, but actually, no, they're not arbitrary because the A's have to be positive. This is very important because if you just give me a random set, uh, a random set of vectors in Rn, so in R3, if you give me three random vectors and you consider all possible linear combinations, then you just get R3. Okay? And so this equation would always have a solution. So it's boring. Okay? But if the coefficients have to be positive, then this is not true. Because when you take positive linear combinations of vectors, you do not in general get, get a linear space. You get a cone. Okay? So let's, let's consider in, in two dimensions. If you had vectors in R2, take these two vectors and form all possible positive uh, linear combinations of them. You do not get R2. You get this set. That's supposed to be straight. So you get, you get a cone. You get a wedge. OK? So you do not get the full set of vectors. So imagine that this vector t, so, so here there's a continuum of vectors, right? But just take the two most extreme ones. So there will be many vectors here, continuously infinite. But it could be that at the end, when you form the linear combinations, you get this cone. Then if t is here, then this equation has no solutions. So really, positivity is the key. Uh, to, to constructing a bound. This is why it's possible to have bounds. It's because this situation could occur. So let me try to, to do a more sophisticated uh, Example, if you are only interested in knowing whether this vector is inside the cone or not, clearly you do not care about the scale, right? You only care about the direction where this vector is pointing. And it's either inside or not, OK? So what this means is that this cone, there's a symmetry when you change the scale, right? The cone looks, if you cut it here or here or here, it always looks like a line segment. It's just increasing because of the scale. But that's irrelevant for determining whether t is inside or not. So for instance, let me draw it like this. This was t. If you consider the line made of t, then when you cut it like this, you see it's outside this one. Here it's outside. Here it's outside. It's always outside, right? So it doesn't care. So we might as well just cut the cone to, to simplify things. OK? So the, the scale of the cone is important because it will fix the overall scale of these a's. OK? But uh, apart from that, whether this thing is a linear combination of this or not, it can be determined, determined just by cutting this. I'm saying this because now it's going to be R3, and I cannot draw 3D pictures. So let me do it in 2D. <laughs> OK? So now the vectors are in R3, and I'm going to cut things with a plane. OK? And so a vector is just going to be a point, because I'm looking from it from above. And so, OK, let me try to draw this. So this is V alpha. Well, let me write it as V delta. And this is T. So suppose that when you consider the full set of vectors, let me ignore spin. Let's just say there's just one spin, OK? So spin is a discrete label, but the conformal dimension is continuous. So when you look at the full set of all possible vectors for any delta, imagine that, again, so you get many, many vectors, and then you cut it with a plane, and you get this line. OK? A bunch of points in R2 which give you a line. And this is one particular vector. It's the vector t seen from above. So it's just a point. OK? So these are our vectors. This is t. And now we want to consider all po uh, positive linear combinations of these vectors in this line. If you do that, the result is the convex hull of these vectors. You know what the convex hull is? Convex hull is give me a bunch of points. Uh, 
and blow a soap bubble, and the soap bubble will hug the points as much as it wants to. Okay, and the final result is the convex hull, or some rubber bands if you want, okay? something that wants to collapse as much as it's, it can. So the soap bubble that hugs this shape is something like this. Maybe I should draw it in a different line. So again, this is n equals three, yeah? It goes here, then it goes here, and then it's this, okay? So the convex hull is this region. It means that any positive linear combination of those vectors v, it will give you a cone, and the cone, when you slice it, it looks like this, okay? It has a, a, here there's a boundary which is a straight line, but then it's curved, and then it's straight, okay? So doing positive linear combinations of any of these vectors will give you a, a vector which will lie inside this pink region, okay? Is this clear? This is pretty important, actually, just understanding the geometry. So if you have questions, don't hesitate. I, I think at the beginning, this is a bit hard to, to grasp what's going on. So to be we were in n equals three, so there were some bunch of vectors, okay? They, they, they formed some cone, and then when you cut the cone with a plane, those vectors, they, sh they do this curve, and the set of all possible positive linear combinations of those vectors, when you cut it with the plane, it's going to give you some shape. This shape is this, okay? Maybe it's easy to think just of the case where you have four vectors in R3, then when you slice the cone, you get a square. Okay, so this is not a square, but that's the same idea. So, uh, so the, the vectors on this curve, they are, they are labeled by the conformal dimension. And so, when you set a gap, it means that you are excluding some of the vectors. This is why I put a dashed line. And so, as you move the gap, you're going to be doing this, and so this boundary is going to be moving as well. So, when the, in this case, the, delta, the gap is such that the target vector is inside the convex hull, and so, here there are solutions. Solutions to crossing. You can find a set of vectors here, the V delta, such that adding them up with positive coefficients will give you T. Okay? Now let me draw, try to draw the same thing. So T is here. Got the gap. So it's going to be the same thing. So you see what happens now is that we've increased the gap so much that now the target vector is outside the convex hull. And so in this case, there, is no, there are no solutions. There are no solutions to crossing. This means that you've just discovered an upper bound on the dimension of the leading scalar operator in the OP. It's telling you that if the first scalar in the OP has a dimension equal to this value, the crossing sum rule cannot have solutions. So no CFT exists satisfying that condition. Okay? There is no approximation in this statement. Again, we've truncated. We've truncated, right, to n equals 3. But if you increase n, you'll only make things worse because if you couldn't find the solution before, how can adding more constraints help you? It will not. It will just make life worse. Okay? So, good. Now, obviously, for, for, for n equals 3, you can still draw things. But if you want to get good bounds, you need to take n a lot larger, and then you cannot draw things. So you need a good criterion for ruling out solutions to crossing. <coughs> 
which does not depend on geometric intuition. Uh, to see how th that comes about, uh, there's a, actually something very simple, which is that in this case, there is a gap between t and all the other vectors, right? In particular, I can draw a line here, a hyperplane. Okay, in this case, it's just a straight line because we are in R2. And this line has the property that t is on one side and all the other vectors are on the other side, right? So if you can construct such a, such a line, you've proved that there can be no solution to crossing, okay? So what's a line? A line in this case, in, in, in d equals three, it would, it would be a plane, right? So if you go back to the cone picture, it would be a, a plane, so, so let me do it in d equals two. Um, Okay, so going back to the cone, you see that in d equals two, it would be a, a line that goes through the origin. In general, it's a hyperplane that goes through the origin. Okay, but a hyperplane that goes through the origin defines a linear functional. It's something that you can dot with a vector to get a number. That, the meaning of that number is roughly, it's the distance, it's the projection of the vector on the hyperplane, right? Okay, so there's a normal vector to the hyperplane, and so the action is n dotted, well, I'm going to call it lambda. So lambda dotted into v gives you the projection onto the hyperplane, right? And so you see that in this case, what you want is lambda dotted v is, say, positive, and lambda dotted into t is negative. So this means that t is on one side of the hyperplane and all the other vectors are on the other side. Clearly, if that happens, there can be no solution to crossing. Just geometrically, you can, you can visualize it. But you, you can just prove it. You can just prove it algebraically. So suppose that you found such a functional, which for, for any alpha, you have to do it for all the vectors, right? So for any alpha in some set, namely this, this set, okay? Suppose that you found a lambda which satisfies this. Then you've just ruled out solutions to crossing. For suppose that such a solution would exist, then take that functional and dot it into this equation. You would get If you take that functional and you dot it here, then you would get sum over alpha of a alpha lambda dot v is equal to lambda dot t, right? If you had found such a solution, then I could just do this. But now you, get, you have a contradiction because lambda on v is always positive. This is positive and this is negative. So it, 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 such solutions cannot exist, okay? Again, the point now is that this, this statement is completely independent of dimensionality of the truncation. It works for any n, okay? So our job then is to numerically construct these lambdas. Lambda satisfying these properties for all, for all alpha in some set. So, for all alpha in some set. If you can find that, then no CFT with, quant with operators uh, whose quantum numbers lie in, those, in that set can exist, okay? Because there's no solution to crossing, okay? So, questions about that, about this? If you get nothing out of these lectures, you should get this. This is the most important thing. <laughs>
you cannot say anything. Because at this level of the truncation, you can find solutions. But it could be that when you add more constraints, that solution will be wrong. So this is a, a bound. So if you can find the function, you've ruled it out once and for all. Yeah, that's why it's a bound. So it, this delta gap can only go down. It can always go down. In practice, what we do is that we do for add, and we increase it, increase it. And at some point, the, the optimal value of this gap will stabilize. So we believe that this is the correct true bound. Um, OK, so this is one part of the story. Now let me just tell you something interesting that you didn't ask about, which is here there is no solution. Sorry. Here there is no solution. And here there are infinitely many solutions, because there are many possible choices of v's which will give you a t. OK? But clearly, there's an intermediate regime here, right? As you lower delta gap, so in order to get the optimal bound on, on this gap, you should make it such that the functional barely exists. And this will happen when t will touch the boundary of the convex hull, right? So you, you lower this, and this line will start to move. And at some point, it will, it will do this, OK? Right? This is a very interesting point, because at that point, the functional, which is this straight line, the straight line coincides with one of the boundaries of the cone, of, the, of this convex hull, right? This straight line will match the function. The, the function will be squeezed between the target and the boundary, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to touch it. It's going to be tangent to it in general, right? Yes? But if, if it touches some of the points, it means that the functional, when it acts on the vectors that lie on that boundary, it kills them, right? Because the distance from, of those vectors to the hyperplane is zero. Right? They, satisfy, they satisfy the hyperplane equation. It means that lambda dot v is 0. Okay? And the function will also kill the target. So here I wrote as a strictly less. But what's going to happen is that as you do this, this will still be true. But what, what's, what happens is that the function wants to kill it. And so the components, they will start getting some crazy large numbers to compensate for the 0. Okay? It wants to kill it. So it's becoming smaller and smaller. But since it cannot, the, the functional, it, notice that the function is always defined up to a scale, right? I can just rescale everything. It will not change this statement. So I could have picked a different normalization condition. Um, so uh, so what it, it, it's it, perhaps it, it's better sometimes to say this and add some other normalization condition, because otherwise lambda equals 0 is the solution, right? And we do not want that. We want non-trivial functions. So plus normalization. Like lambda 1 is equal to 1, or something like this. Whatever you want, just to stop it from being 0. Uh, so what happens here, then it's very interesting, because the functional, it touches the convex hull, so it's going to kill some of the vectors. And it's going to kill the target. OK? This had to be the case, because when there is a solution, there should not be a, fu a functional. Otherwise, you get this contradiction, right? You get a contradiction. Uh, so how is it possible to both have a functional and have a solution? Well, the only possibility is that there is only one solution to crossing. And that solution is made up of the vectors that the functional kills. Because then lambda dot v will be 0 on those vectors. And it will be 0 on the target. So you get 0 equals 0, which is consistent. Okay, And you can also see this geometrically. Because at that point, so let me draw it again. At that point, the functional does this. So this is t. This is some vector, call it v1. And this is some vector, call it v2. So v1, v2, and t are killed by the functional. right? But look, these are three vectors in R3. They cannot all be killed by the same functional, because if they form a basis, they could not be all killed by the same functional, right? Because three linearly independent vectors, they form a basis. So they cannot be linear dependent. So the fact that lambda kills the vectors is a statement of linear dependence, right? 
So the only possibility is that V1, V2, and T, they are not uh, uh, linearly independent. In other words, T can be written as a linear combination of V1 and V2. Okay? This magic happens only at this extremal point, this extremal case. This is the case where the delta gap is optimal. The bound cannot get any better than this particular point where, when this happens. So when you draw a bound, uh, you have a bound. So imagine that now you do this for many delta phi. Right? So you have delta phi. And you play this game for all the delta phi. And you can find functionals, and they give you some region. So at all these points, you can find the functional. So there is no solution to crossing. And here, you can never. So the optimal bound is at this point, along this curve. And what this is telling you is that along this curve, there is a unique solution to crossing. And that solution can be obtained by looking at the zeros of the functional that you've constructed. Okay. So in this particular case, again, so there's a V1, there's a V2. So what I've just told you is that Sorry, sorry. Um, let, let me just uh, finish what I was saying. So at extremality, what you have is that lambda dot v1 is 0, lambda dot v2 is 0, and lambda dot t is 0. And we are in R3. So this, these are linear constraints, right? The only possibility is that v1 and v2 are not linearly independent from t. Right? Otherwise, lambda would be 0. OK? Um, so since, since v1, v2, and t are linearly dependent, then the following is true. a1, v1 plus a2, v2 is equal to t for some a1 and a2, positive. This has to be true. And in particular, we, we can even compute lambda. There's only one possibility for lambda, is that lambda, uh, the component A, has to be epsilon A, B, C, V1, B, V2, C. Right? Because if you dot lambda with V1, since this is anti-symmetric, you, you all know what this is, right? Uh, it's going to kill V1. It's going to kill V2. Uh, and the fact that it kills t means that t can be written as a sum of uh, v1 and, uh, and v2. OK? So again, this is striking for, for two reasons. One is that there is a unique solution to crossing at that point. So you can just compute it. And the second thing is that the solution is sparse. We had R3. So you would expect that you would need three vectors to obtain t, right? It's R3, so in general, you need 3. But here, you only get 2. So there's some magic that happens. You only need two vectors to, to obtain t. Right? Does this make sense? Generically, we are in R3. You expect that you need three vectors, at least. But at extremality, you only need 2. OK? That statement is the statement that the functional exists. It's the same thing. If a functional exists, then actually you only need two instead of three. Okay. So this only happens precisely at that extremality point. So, uh, uh, there's more that you can say. Uh, because Again, extremality implies more things. It implies, for instance, that uh, the functional, it kills v2, it kills v1, but furthermore, it's tangent. It has to be tangent to this uh, space, right? 
So it must also kill the derivative. So maybe I should have called v2, v1 this, and then this v2. Then what do we have? We should, we should have that. Let's dot lambda with the derivative of the vectors with respect to delta. So how the vectors are changing as you, as you change the delta. Then when you dot it with d delta v1, here it's 0, but here it has to be positive. So this has to be positive. Okay. What about this guy, d delta v2? It has to be 0 because it's tangent. OK? So 670. OK. So this is an inequality, so it's not too important. But now look at the following. Here there are, th there are uh, three equations, right? And here there's, there is one. And lambda is defined in this way. So suppose that you did not know, you did not know what v1 and v2 were. Okay? Because I, I still haven't told you how to compute this lambda, right? So here you just drew it. But on the computer, there's a, sp a specific method for computing lambda. But suppose you didn't want to do any of that. Then a different way would be, well, I have three equations here and uh, one equation here. So there are four equations. And how many variables are there? Well, there are four. There's the conformal dimension of this vector, the conformal dimension of this one. We don't know what they are, right? So there's a delta 1 and a delta 2. And there's a1 and a2. a1, a2, delta 1, and delta 2. So you see that an alternative way of obtaining the bound would be instead of constructing functionals and varying the gap, uh, et cetera, you could just say, well, I know that at extremality, these equations have to be solved, so let me just try to solve them. OK? So these are nonlinear equations in delta because these, these v's are complicated functions of delta, right? But it's just four nonlinear equations. So you can go on mathematic and say, well, find me a solution to these four equations. And if you do that, then you can get exactly the same result as by this method. OK? And this is because of extremality. You can do this because there are only two vectors instead of three. OK? Um, I don't know of any such statement. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's true, but um, I don't think this has been formalized. So if you're, if you're below extremality, then basically the functional, ah, so actually I should tell you just something. Uh, um, clearly, if you plot lambda dot v, then the functional looks very nice. It does this, right? This is v1 and this is v2 as a function of delta. So the, po the functional is positive everywhere above delta gap, and it has zeros at the right place. So historically, what people did is that they computed these functionals numerically. So there are, there are specific methods. I'll talk about one of them ne next lecture. There are methods for determining these lambdas. Okay? And then they would, they would make the gap approach the, the optimal bound as much as possible. And what they would see is that the functional initially, initially it was doing something like this. And then as you approach the optimal gap, it's forced to go down. And eventually, it will touch the boundary, and it will have 0. So then you'd plot and you'd say, oh, these are the zeros. And from these zeros, I could construct a solution to crossing. This is how it was done. Well, it's, it's actually how it's still done. Uh, this is what people do. They construct these functionals. So the story of this numerical uh, bootstrap is computing conformal blocks efficiently and computing these lambdas efficiently. 
That's basically it. Okay? You need to do these two things. Uh, the blocks is more or less solved. Uh, and yes? Yes, exactly. Um, well, there are several answers to that question. Uh, first of all, what we observe is that good CFTs that we know and love, they tend to lie on the boundary of the bounds. So you get some bound, and in principle, yes, this could be some completely unphysical thing. But then when you look up, oh, let me look up the 3 d zing CFT. Where should it be on this plot? Oh, it's on the boundary. Any CFT that lies on the boundary, the solution to crossing has to be obtained by this. There's a unique solution. I just told you there's a unique solution. So the 3 d zing CFT, the solution to crossing, will be exactly the same as the one that you compute this. Now, this solution is, of course, not exact. As you increase n, you get more and more vectors, and their dimensions are going to change. But what you observe is that dimensions of low-lying operators can start converging, and so do their OPE coefficients as you increase n. And this allows you to determine the spectrum and the, the OPEs very accurately. So nowadays, we have maybe 100 operators in the 3D easing model with uh, precision varying from 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 3. So this is a good uh, method. And again, it's because the solution is unique. It's fixed by this equation. So whatever CFT the 3D easing is, its spectrum has to match with, with this one. So this is why this is useful. And again, why does, this, why does this work so well? I mean, you can do like with n equals 3, you, you can already get a good approximation maybe to 10%. It works very well. Like 10%, yeah, two equations, you can almost do it by hand. Uh, it works because of what I explained at the beginning of, of these lectures, OPE convergence. Converges exponentially fast. So you expect that just with a few operators, you've already solved a lot of these constraints. Not exactly, but quite accurately. So this is why these methods have a hope of working uh, quite well. OK? Um, so did I want, I wanted to say one last thing. It's, is that, so these equations, they fix a solution. OK? But generically, these equations can be very hard to solve because they are nonlinear equations. So finding a solution in this complicated, many-dimensional space is, is hard. But suppose that you already had a solution that you computed with some other methods. I will talk about one. So you compute this functional using some other method, and you get one solution. Then what you can do is you linearize these equations, which tell you how to go from one solution to the next. OK? So you can do that instead. So find the first solution using some other method, and then get the nearby ones by linearization of these equations. So let me just give you an example here. Even in this setup, you can do this. So I told you, you have to solve these four equations in Mathematica. So you go through some work, Mathematica finds you a solution. Uh, and now you want to know, well, if I vary delta phi, what's going to happen? Well, then it's easy to check. So just take those four equations and linearize them. Maybe I should do it. Uh, so let, let's linearize delta A1. Uh, V1 plus A1 uh, D delta 1 D delta V1 plus delta A2 V2 plus A2 D delta 2 D delta V2 is equal to delta T. Okay, so when you vary delta phi. So let's vary the external dimension. Uh, so many things will change, right? So we just linearize it. Well, let's dot lambda, the original lambda, on this equation. This is a good idea because lambda kills v1, it kills v2, it kills d delta v2. The only thing it doesn't kill is this. So you get lambda delta t is equal to a1 d delta 1 lambda dot d delta v1. But there's only one unknown in this equation. It's this. This I already know. This I know because the variation of t is fixed, right? Uh, t is the identity, so it's always the identity for any delta phi. So you get that the variation d delta 1 with d delta phi 
So this is the gap, right, by definition, is equal to uh, lambda delta t divided by a1 lambda d delta v1. OK? Uh, And again, you can check this in Mathematica. Compute at two very close by points in delta phi using those four equations, and then check that they are related in this way. But of course, this is much simpler, right? So this just gives you the, the next point at the gap for free. OK? Uh, so this is the idea of uh, something called extreme of flows, where again, you, you find one point, and then you can flow by solving some equation. So this gives you one of the numbers, this one. There are many other numbers, like these. There are many other unknowns, this one, this one, and so on. There are other equations that fix those. So, but the idea is that you can just solve those equations iteratively and get the full bound once you have a starting point. Um, and it's all a consequence of extremality, the fact that this functional touches the boundary uh, in, in the maximal gap uh, case. OK, so this, there's been a lot to take in here. But this is really it, OK? This is how the bootstrap works. Everything above and beyond this is, to, the most, to some extent, just bells and whistles. Okay? So if you understand this, you've understood it. You've understood the bootstrap. So questions? No, no, the, the zeros will be different. It will be at the different positions. Is that the question? Yeah. There will be more vectors as well. Yeah. Here there were three. We were in R3, and there were two vectors. Generically, what you expect is that in Rn, there should be n minus 1 vectors in the solution. But actually, in practice, there's a lot less. But should, should, are the zeros eventually going to stabilize when we take n large? Yes. Like, yes. So vectors with small conformal dimension they, they start moving less and less. So new zeros come in, and those in the beginning, they vary a lot, and then they converge. And so this is, this is the logic. So you shouldn't take your very seriously for the first few uh, Yes. Well, in practice, what you, again, what I say is that often you do this. Even with n equals 3, you get the right result to 10%. So this is the minimal amount of work, and it already gives you an excellent approximation. I mean, to get 10% in perturbation theory, say, it's a long way. Many diagrams, Borel resumation, for 3D easing, say. So the fact that this, with this simple-minded approach, already gives you 10%, it's amazing. And it gives you OP coefficients. Yeah, I'm not even talking about OP coefficients in, in perturbation theory. Um, so I, oh, maybe I should just say a comment. This idea of, instead of doing, uh, using algorithms for computing lambda, the algorithms are called linear programming and semi-definite programming. Instead of doing that using these equations, this is originally introduced by Gliozzi, and it's called Gliozzi's method. But it's not exactly Gliozzi's method, because Gliozzi's method basically only uses these equations. And generically, this is not sufficient. There, there, there will be many solutions. So you really need these ones to fix the rest uh, of the unknowns. But anyway, just as a, the people sometimes that there are two ways of doing bootstrap, the Gliozzi method, and but they are related in this way. OK. What, what do you mean linear? Like, is the error going to grow exponentially as I move? So I find some solution, and then I integrate this linear solution? Yes. Does it stay? Yeah, like excellent question. Yes. Uh, that's a very good point. Yes, you might worry, well, you solve these equations using Euler's method or something like this. It's going to get very bad very quickly. But the point is that. Uh, the equations can autocorrect. So imagine that you do that, and there will be some error, right? So then these equations will not be satisfied. There will be an error term. So you, you treat that as a correction and flow again to find the, the correct place. Or in other words, these, are, these equations can be request, recast as equations which are of the type f of x equals 0. And to find solutions to this equation, you can use Newton's method. OK? Um, and so this will converge to the solution. And uh, in fact, it's the opposite. 
usually to find the, the optimal delta gap, it's a lot of work, and you cannot get, very, get it very precisely. But then you plug these equations, and you can get it to, I don't know, 10 to the minus 50 or something like this using this property. So you can correct errors using this. More questions? Okay. 